Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you here this morning. If you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 110. Psalm 110 this morning. And if you don't have a Bible with you, our passage is found in the Pew Bible in front of you on page 348. 348. We're going to be reading all of Psalm 110 this morning, but we are going to focus in uh, specifically only on verse 1 this morning. And so if you've turned with me, if you will stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God as we read together Psalm 110. Psalm 110, which is a psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. And I pray that this morning as we take this time devoted solely to you, may your word be a light to us. May it reveal to us glorious person and work of your son Jesus. God, I pray as we have our eyes open to see the wonders of Christ, may we be changed. May our hearts be drawn to Christ. May we be filled with a renewed hatred for our sin. May we find ourselves lovingly, willingly, joyfully submitting ourselves and our lives and every part of our lives to the service of Christ. And so, Father, we pray that your Spirit will teach us, apply these words to our hearts. May we be transformed this morning. May you strengthen your church. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Has anyone ever asked you if you have a life verse? I've been asked that before. Um, It used to be a big deal. Uh, You used to have to have a life verse. You should have a life verse. Um, I don't know if that's even a thing. Do people still talk about their life verse? Life verse. When someone asks me that, I assume that they're asking me for my favorite Bible verse. But even then, I'm at a loss with over 31,000 verses in the Bible. How can you pick just one? How can you narrow down your favorite to just one verse? That's not to say that we won't have meaningful verses that we turn to, but they may change depending on our life situations. I don't think that we should nail down one specific verse. This is my favorite verse for the rest of my life. This is my life verse. Last December, uh, the YouVersion Bible app revealed the one verse that was shared, bookmarked, or highlighted the most in 2018. If, if you have a Bible app on your phone, chances are you have the YouVersion app. It's very, very popular. 
they analyzed the verses that were shared and bookmarked and highlighted, and the most popular verse in the U.S. in 2018 was Isaiah 41.10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You virgin wasn't the, uh, they weren't alone in analyzing how people were reading their Bibles online. Bible Gateway, which is a Bible study website, compiled a list of the most read verses based upon 920 million searches on their website. I'll give you the top 10. Number 10, most uh, searched most read Bible verse of 2018 according to the Bible Gateway. Number 10 was Matthew 6.33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Number 9, Psalm 23, verse 5. Number 8, Psalm 23, verse 1. Number 7, Psalm 23, verse 6. Number 6, Romans 12, verse 2. Number five, jumping ahead of its competition, Psalm 23, verse 4. Number four was Romans 8, 28. Number three was Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Number two was John 3, 16. And number one, everyone's favorite Bible verse, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. These people who look that up the most should have looked up Jeremiah 29.10 while they were at it. I'm sure that you have favorite Bible verses, um, favorite passages. Hopefully you've memorized certain verses that you can recall when you're going through difficult times or, or to, to help you to live godly lives when you're tempted, one of the best things you could do is have Bible verses memorized, meditating upon God's Word. We all have favorite Bible verses. Have you ever thought about what verses the apostles liked? What were some of the go-to passages for the New Testament church? Well, thanks to their writings, we actually do know. And the answer might surprise you. It's not Jeremiah 29, 11. It's not 2 Chronicles 7, 14, even though those are favorites in American Christianity. The most quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament is the book of Psalms. Some of you might have that as your favorite book also. The most quoted psalm in the New Testament Psalm 110. The most quoted Old Testament verse in the New Testament, well, you probably already see it coming. Psalm 110, verse 1. It is quoted or alluded to in the New Testament at least 16 times. More than any of the other Psalms, more than any other verse in the Old Testament, this is the go-to verse for the apostles. Jesus quoted it. Peter, Paul, the book of Hebrews, it has been suggested that the book of Hebrews is actually a sermon exegeting Psalm 110. It's alluded to in Revelation. So if this psalm and the first verse of this psalm in particular are the most quoted verse in the New Testament, then I believe that we would be wise to diligently study it for ourselves, don't you? But as we approach this text, our prayer ought to be that of Charles Spurgeon, who wrote concerning Psalm 110, may the Spirit who spoke by the man after God's own heart, give us eyes to see the hidden mysteries of this marvelous psalm where every word has an infinity of meaning. Where every word has an infinity 
of meaning. And indeed, the New Testament writers have given us such a wealth of understanding concerning this psalm that that we're only going to look at this first verse today because there's no way that we could look at verse 1 and the rest of the psalm all in one sermon. Unless you guys are cool with staying here all afternoon. It got really quiet all of a sudden. This is the most quoted and alluded to verse in the New Testament, and it tells us so much about the person and work of Christ so that we who are trusting in him might be encouraged and strengthened and have hope as as we learn more about our glorious Savior in just one verse. And so let's use the key of the New Testament to crack open the lid of the treasure chest that is Psalm 110, verse 1. And as we do, as as we lift up the lid and we gaze at this treasure, may we look with awe and wonder upon the powerful person and work of Christ Jesus and what he did on our behalf. And so the first thing that we want to see is the Messiah's secret identity. The Messiah's secret identity identity. Look at this verse again. We'll be reading this verse several times this morning. You you may actually have it memorized by the time you leave here today. That would be a shame, wouldn't it? Psalm 110 verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. God had promised to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, that one of his descendants, one of his sons, would be seated upon the royal throne forever. This is first a promise that David's dynasty would be eternal, that that there would be a king sitting on the throne, that, that no matter the difficulties, the hardships, the oppression of surrounding nations, his lineage would not be cut off. They would always be able to know the son of David. But more than that, the promises found in 2 Samuel chapter 7 focus on one Davidic king in particular. And this one particular Davidic king goes by a variety of different names. He is the seed of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent. He is the son of Abraham through whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. He's the one from the tribe of Judah The lion from the tribe of Judah to whom the royal scepter and the obedience of the people belonged. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. But who would it be? Who would it be? This really is the question throughout the entire Old Testament. Who is the Christ? Who is the Messiah? When will he show up? What will he be like? David knew it wasn't him. And it wasn't Solomon. So who was it? Who would it be? Being a prophet, however, God revealed something about the identity of the Messiah, and David put it into the beginning of this psalm. The Lord, all caps, right? Yahweh says to my Lord. Yahweh says to Adonai. He doesn't clearly spell it out, though. It's it's still a secret. There's still this secret identity that the Messiah has. Now, when I say secret identity, I'm not talking about Batman or Spider-Man who are completely hiding their identity so that no one, not even their, their closest friends, can recognize them. Rather, I'm talking about Superman and Superman's secret identity. Have you ever been confused about Superman's secret identity? His secret identity is he puts on some wire rim glasses, right? This isn't what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about Superman who takes off his glasses and puts a little curly strand in his hair and all of a sudden everyone doesn't know, oh, this is Clark Kent. I'm not talking 
I, that, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about Batman or Spider-Man that you can't figure it out. I'm talking about Superman. The secret identity of the Messiah in verse 1 is so obvious that when Jesus came, there was no excuse for anyone to miss him. You read a Superman comic and you just want to shake the people who don't know who this is. <laughs> it's so clear. It's so obvious. It's the same way here in verse 1. The secret identity of the Messiah is so obvious that no one has an excuse for missing him. It's so clear that Jesus uses this verse to actually stump the hard-hearted religious leaders who refuse to see what was right in front of their face. Jesus' interpretation of the first line of Psalm 110 is so important that Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record it. Unbelieving Jews to this very day miss it, will you? Let's look at Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. And we'll do something that even Jimmy Olsen couldn't do. Unmask the superhero. Matthew 22, verses 41 through 46. Matthew 22, verses 41 through 46. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. All right, the context is uh, putting Jesus to the test. He's in the hot seat on their own self-made quiz show. And they're, they're coming to him with all these questions. And, and Jesus, being Jesus, is stumping all of them. And so the Pharisees, they come and they gather together and they put forward their hero. One of them, a lawyer. Oh, excuse me, I, I apologize. We're on verse 40, 41 and I, I jump back. It happens every once in a while. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. So now Jesus asked them a question. Saying, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, he's the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David in the spirit calls him Lord? Saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. So here's what Jesus does. They've been asking him questions, so now he says, I'm going to ask you a question. What do you think about the Christ? What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? Very basic question. You would think that the religious elite of Jesus' day would be able to answer this, this very basic question. Whose son is the Messiah? Who are we supposed to be looking for? Well, they say he's the son of David. They're going back to places like 2 Samuel chapter 7, where the Messiah is coming from the line of David. But now Jesus points them to our psalm. He points them to our text, Psalm 110. The first thing that we can understand about this text is that universally, this was a text that was assumed to be about the Christ. He doesn't have to argue that Psalm 110 is about the Messiah. He just assumes it, and the Pharisees go along with it. This was the understanding. This psalm is about the Christ. But Jesus, he throws them a little curveball, doesn't he? They say, well, the Messiah, the Christ, he, he's the son of David, but... Jesus says, how is it then that David in the spirit calls him Lord? Because look at the text. The text says Yahweh, God, says to my, David's Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David calls him Lord, how can he also be a son? Who is he? There's Yahweh, there's the Lord, Speaking to David's Lord. And in, a Jew, in the Jewish culture, it would have been unthinkable for David 
to consider any one of his sons, any one of his descendants, his Lord, his sovereign. Unless there's more to the Messiah than what first meets the eye. And indeed there is. The Pharisees get the first part of the question right. The Christ is David's son. There is no arguing about that. The Messiah was David's descendant. But what they can't do is they can't get the second half out of their mouth. The Christ is David's Lord because the Christ is David's God. We pick up a little bit of this in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, where Paul says that he's been set apart for the gospel of God, which God promised beforehand through his pro prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son. Concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh. There he is. He's the son of David. But he was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. He is something more than simply David's son. Jesus looks at Psalm 110 and, and he says, Hey, don't you see? The identity of the Christ is not that of just another man, but he is also divine. And that's what we too must confess. Christ Jesus is fully man, but he is also fully God. $10,000 word coming out here right now. The hypostatic union. This is the coming together of the divine son and human nature. And in the incarnation, these two natures come together to form one person. The fully God, fully human Messiah, Jesus, David's Lord, and ours. The Messiah wasn't Hercules. He wasn't half man and half God. This was the mythology of the Greeks. Jesus is not 50% human and 50% divine. Jesus, in this perfect union, is 100% God. He is fully God and 100% man, fully man, in one person. And this is a glorious mystery. He's the 200% man. There's no one like him. There's never been anyone like him. There will never be anyone ever again like him. And what Jesus says is so profound that the Pharisees, they give up. No one was able to answer him. Not because the answer isn't theirs, because they are so hard-hearted that there is no way that they are ever going to confess that the Messiah is God. And from that day, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Smart move. The Christ is not simply a good moral teacher. He's not the archangel Michael. He's not the spirit brother of Lucifer. He's not one prophet out of many prophets. He's not another reincarnation of the Krishna. Jesus is the eternal son of the most high God. The writer of Hebrews says, to which of the angels has he, the father, ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Psalm 110. Jesus is the son of of God. He is fully man. He is fully divine. He is the one through whom and for whom all things exist. He is co-equal in divinity. He is co-equal in majesty and glory. And he, along with the Father, is worthy of our worship and our obedience. Do you know this Jesus? 
Do you know this Jesus? Is this the Jesus you worship? Or are you satisfied with buddy Jesus? Have you created a Jesus of your own liking? Anything less than the Jesus of Psalm 110 cannot save you. Christianity is not the buffet line where you can just pick and choose what you want to believe. It's this Jesus or nothing. Only the incarnate Son of God can save. With the identity of the Messiah revealed in verse 1, verse 1 also exposes something extraordinary. What we read here is an inter-Trinitarian dialogue. God, he condescends to let us eavesdrop on the Father speaking to the Son. And when we bring in what Jesus teaches in Matthew 22, we have the full picture. Remember what he said in Matthew 22, verse 43? David, he spoke this in the Holy Spirit. And so here in verse 1, we have a psalm of David in the Spirit. And Yahweh the Father says to Adonai the Son. And we have the Trinity in one line of Psalm 110. We have a revelation of the Trinity. We have the secret identity of the Messiah. Are you worshiping this Jesus? Is this the Jesus you know? This is the Jesus who deserves and demands our full obedience, our full worship. The Messiah of, of this first line is not the Messiah that we can be bored with. He's not the Messiah that we yawn over. He's not the Messiah that we are to ignore. This is the Messiah that, that all of our life, all of our affections, all of our thoughts, they ought to be centered on Him alone. Examine yourselves. Is this the Jesus you know? We have the secret identity of the Messiah here in the first line. He is both David's son and David's Lord. What a glorious mystery. That here is the one who, over hundreds and hundreds of years, is the product of David's DNA. But he is the one who created David's DNA. This is amazing. This is a powerful, powerful Savior. Fully God. And yet in his loving kindness, he condescends to be one of us to walk amongst us, to tabernacle amongst us so that he might save us. We not only have the Messiah's secret identity, but we also have the Messiah's privileged seat. His privileged seat. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Here is the divine decree. This is the Father speaking to the Son, saying, sit at my right hand. This isn't come over here and take a load off. Right? The Son isn't invited to sit on the heavenly lazy boy. This is the language of royalty. Compare this to the decree that's found in Psalm chapter 2. I will tell of the decree. 
The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. God has established his king, the Messiah. And he is seated seated in glorious majesty at the right hand of God. Um, This term, right hand, it it can be confusing as if we're to picture a specific location with the Father sitting on the throne and and here's Jesus right here. Um, What we're we're supposed to picture here is not location. All right, that's not the primary idea. The idea here is of strength. It's a power. Jacob naming his son Benjamin, the son of my right hand, the son of my strength. Exodus chapter 15, verse 6, your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. My poor wife is left-handed. This is not denigrating left-handed people. Though I think it's very clear from the number of us that right-handed people are the chosen ones. (laughs) The idea of God's right hand, it's power. With your right hand, oh God, you shatter your enemy. Psalm chapter 16. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Even on this page, the right hand is used to communicate this idea of strength. Psalm 109, verses 30 and 31. Psalm 109, it speaks of the Messiah's betrayal and suffering. But look at verses 30 and 31. With my mouth, I will give great thanks to the Lord. I will praise him in the midst of the throng. For he stands at the right hand of the needy one to save him from those who condemn his soul to death. Our verse, sit at my right hand. Look down at verse 5. The Lord is at your right hand. The Messiah judges the nations in the power and authority of Yahweh. Which one is it? Is the Messiah at the right hand of God or is God at the right hand of the Messiah? Well, if we're talking about location, then it makes no sense. But what we're talking about is the right hand of power and authority. The Messiah, he he judges the nations because he is at the right hand of Yahweh. But he's able to judge the nations with all power because Yahweh is at his right hand. And in his exaltation, as he is seated at the right hand of the Father, Jesus rules from heaven over this evil age until every enemy is made his footstool. The picture is of a king putting his foot on the neck of a vanquished foe. This idea of a footstool. We can see this in Joshua chapter 10. In Joshua chapter 10, Joshua and Israel, they are fighting against these five kings. And these kings, they run in, they hide in a cave. Um, And they lose this game of hide and seek. They find them in this cave and they roll a stone over the mouth of the cave until they fight the the army and defeat them. And then they come back, they open up this cave, and they bring out these five kings from the cave. And it says they did so and brought the five kings out to Joshua from the cave. The king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon. And when they brought these kings out to Joshua, Joshua summoned all the men of Israel and said to the chiefs of the men of war who had gone with him, come near, put your feet on the necks of these kings. Then they came near and put their feet on their necks. 
And Joshua said to them, Do not be afraid or dismayed. Be strong and courageous, for thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. And afterward, Joshua struck them and put them to death. This idea of putting your foot on the neck of your vanquished enemy, it's to show absolute conquest. You, you have, there's nowhere for them to run. They can't hide. They, they are not in any position of power. They are under the boot hill of the king. And that's the idea that we see here in Psalm 110. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool, until you put your foot on their neck. Or, as we could say in the language of the Messiah, until you crush his head. It's complete and utter victory. Jesus will reign until he has fully and finally defeated every enemy. There's not going to be any escape convicts. There's not going to be anyone who, who is left out of this conquest. Either you are with King Jesus or you are going to be made into his footstool. This idea of Jesus seated at the right hand um, is proclaimed all over the New Testament by various apostles. And what they do is they highlight different aspects of Jesus' reign. And so we want to look at some of these areas in which Psalm 110 is quoted in the New Testament in order for us to develop kind of a, a 3D understanding of the work of Christ in this regard. It's important that we realize that Christ has sat down at the right hand of the Father. And so we're going to look at some passages that, that show us what exactly this means according to the apostles. And so the first place that we want to look is in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And we're going to be looking at, uh, at several passages. So wet that thumb. Get it ready uh, to flip to different passages. Let's look at how Peter uses this in Acts chapter 2. This is his sermon at Pentecost. Christ has died. He has been risen from the grave. He has ascended. The Holy Spirit has come. And now there's a lot of questions. What does this mean? What is going on here? And so Peter, he, he tells them, this is in fulfillment of prophecy, that in the last days God would pour out his Spirit and it's all because of the work of the Messiah. The coming of the Spirit, it is intimately connected with what Jesus did on the cross by rising again and by ascending. And so we see in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 29, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. But that is so important for us to understand the writings of David in the Psalms, that David is a prophet and he is seeing the, the coming of the Messiah. He's seeing the work of the Christ. This Jesus, God raised up. And of that, we all are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into heaven, but he himself says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And what is Peter's takeaway from this? What is his, his conclusion to all of this? Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. The sending of the Holy Spirit is the evidence that Jesus has been exalted. Psalm 110, verse 1, is not set somewhere in the future. It's a present reality. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God the Father even now. He has received all authority 
in heaven and on earth. The evidence of that is you. You who are recipients of the Holy Spirit are living, breathing evidence that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. That makes the church even more important in your mind, doesn't it? You are a picture. You are evidence in the courtroom. Jesus reigns. He has sent his spirit. His church is being gathered. In Acts chapter 5, Peter makes a contrast between the depths of Jesus' humiliation and the heights of his exaltation. He says, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed, by hanging him on a tree. Here's the depths of his humiliation. He has suffered the curse. Being hung on the tree, he, he was counted as the cursed one. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Here's the height of his exaltation. He has been humiliated in his death, but God has exalted him high above the heavens. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Again, here's the evidence. His exalted position at the right hand of the Father is again witnessed by the Holy Spirit and is proof that Jesus is the Messiah and he is the only one who can forgive sins and save sinners. But let's look at how the writer of Hebrews talks about Psalm 110. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 1. So first, Peter, he uses Psalm 110 to show that Jesus has been exalted as the Savior of all men. He's the only one through whom Men and women like you and I can be saved. But look at what the writer of Hebrews says. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 says, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. After making purification for sins, he sat down. This is important. It's expounded upon in chapter 10. In chapter 10, verse 11, the writer goes on to say, Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. So here's the Levitical priesthood in the temple. They are constantly on the move. There's no leisure time if you're on duty. You are offering sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. It's not chairs. You're standing up. You're working. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. That's Psalm 110. For by a single offering... He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. What is the importance of Jesus sitting down? It means he's done. It means his work is complete. This is the death blow to the Roman Catholic doctrine of the Mass. The Mass wherein Rome teaches that by the doctrine of transubstantiation, what Calvin called hocus-pocus, 
the bread and wine become the actual body and blood of Christ. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that the priests actually offer a sacrifice of Christ over and over and over again. To that, Hebrew says, no, he sat down. This should blast away any view of a works-based salvation. You neither can nor do you ever have to try to earn your salvation. Christ has sat down. He has made purification for sin. He has offered for all time a single sacrifice. Jesus has paid it all. Living the life you could never live. Dying the death that you should have died. Bearing the full weight and force of God's wrath against sin in the sinner's place. Crying out, it is finished. Justice has been served. And having accomplished full and final atonement for sin by his death and resurrection, he ascended to the right hand of the Father and he sat down. There's no more guilt for those who are in Christ. Come to Christ. You who are weighed down by sin. You who are, are living in rebellion. Come to the Savior. Don't come with your good works. Don't come with your religious activities. Come empty-handed to Christ. He has done it all. And the evidence that he has accomplished full and final salvation for all the sins of all his people is the fact that he has sat down. And having sat down, he pleads for us even today. Romans 8, 34, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that who was raised, who is at the right hand of God. That's Psalm 110 who indeed is interceding for us. It's good news that Christ is at the right hand of the Father. It's good news that he sat down. Psalm 110, verse 1, is marvelous news for sinners. Because Christ has accomplished full, final redemption for their sins, and he sat down, and he is interceding for them, and Christ's prayers are always answered. sit at my right hand because the work of redemption is done. The Messiah has been exalted as Lord and Savior. He sends forth the Holy Spirit to apply the work of the cross to the elect and empower them for service. And he intercedes for the saints acting as their faithful high priest even up to this very second. That's a whole systematic theology in five words in Psalm 110 verse 1. You could spend your entire life contemplating this one line. That's the power of the Messiah's privileged privilege seat. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. But we're not done yet. We still have to ask, so what? How should we respond to this? What should our lives look like after being exposed to Psalm 110, verse 1. On April 26, 1986, the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in what is now the Ukraine exploded, creating the worst nuclear disaster in history. Over 300,000 people were told to evacuate as, as these radioisotopes spread, contaminating everything. Within 36 hours, many residents were already showing signs of severe radiation sickness. Today, 33 years later, 1,000 square miles around the plant is an exclusion zone restricted to scientists and government officials. And reactor number four, where the explosion occurred, will be completely enclosed for at least the next 100 years. 
what we see in Psalm 110 verse 1 is more powerful than a million Chernobyls. Will we leave here unaffected? Will we leave here unchanged? Moses was literally glowing after seeing the Lord's back. Will not we who behold the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus not shine in this dark world? You here who have yet to submit to King Jesus and trust in him alone for salvation, won't you run to him now? His work is done. He sat down. The only thing remaining is judgment for his enemies. A judgment that I deserve, that you deserve, but for grace. I pray that you'll be counted as his friend. For the saints, there are many ways in which we could respond to this verse. But let me bring out just two that are explicitly connected to this verse in the New Testament. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The first way we should respond is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verses 20 through 26. Paul is arguing for the resurrection of the dead based upon the resurrection of Christ. He says, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. How should we respond to Psalm 110 verse 1? We should respond in hope. We should respond in hope. It may not look as if Jesus is reigning right now. It may not appear as if his enemies are being made his footstool. But Psalm 110 verse 2 says, rule in the midst of your enemies. Christ is conquering his foes through the power of the gospel. His kingdom is advancing even if it's slow, even if it's small. We don't see it all clearly yet, but Jesus is ruling and he's conquering and and his army is marching and the gates of hell are not going to prevail against the power of the church. And when Christ comes in all of his power and all of his glory, the last enemy will be destroyed. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So lift up your head, O weary saint. We can live in hope because Christ has been seated at the right hand of the Father in majesty. We can respond in hope. This world is a dark place. But we have a hope. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. It will happen. This is certain. It's a surety. We can hope in that. The second way in which we should respond to this is found in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. We live in hope, looking and waiting expectantly into the future. But in the meantime, we, we should respond to this, this passage by living lives of holiness. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ... Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. That's Psalm 110. 
Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. As we're waiting for that final victory, we ought to live lives of holiness. We shouldn't be people who are completely weighed down by the cares of this world. I'm convinced that when Christ returns, there will be professing Christians who won't even realize that it's happened because they're too busy binge-watching a show on Netflix. They won't see Christ coming in the clouds because their head will be down in their phone. Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. And those of us who are in Christ, it's as good as if we were already there too. And if that's the case, then set your minds on things that are above where Christ is. Don't be so concerned with things down here that, that you are, are completely oblivious to the heavenly realities. Set your minds on things that are above because that's where Christ is. And if you've been united with, with Christ by his death and resurrection, then, then you too are seated. So we ought to live like it. In verses 5 through 17, they describe what it looks like as we put sin to death and put on good works. That's how we're supposed to respond when we read that Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father until his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. We who are in Christ ought to be living lives of godliness, putting off the, the deeds of the flesh, putting on the good deeds that give glory to God that show that our treasure is not here on earth, but it's in heaven. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemy your footstool. Every word has an infinity of meaning. Spurgeon was not exaggerating. Psalm 110, verse 1, it's like stumbling across buried treasure. It's like finding Scrooge McDuck's vault full of gold and you just want to dive right in and swim around with him. So much is packed into one verse and there's still six more verses to go. We've seen the deity of the Son of God as verse 1, that, that first line, unmask the Messiah's secret identity. He is fully God and fully man. And we have seen the power and the salvation that flows freely from the Messiah's privileged seat. I pray that you will respond with hope. Devoting your life to godliness. As we trust in Christ, as we trust in this Messiah who is if, even now seated at the right hand of the Father. As he's dispensing salvation freely to all who would come to him in faith. Who intercedes for his people. May we continue to trust in this Jesus. Hoping in him. Living lives of godliness. As we wait for the day when every enemy will be put under his feet. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the treasure that is packed within every line, every word. Forgive us for our laziness as we are content with surface level reading God, may we be 
spurred forward to, to loving the scriptures and to, to digging deeply into them. Not so that we fill our heads with knowledge, but so that we know Christ more. So that we can love him. So that we can serve him. So we can live lives that glorify him. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters that they might be strengthened as they look to Jesus. May they be filled with hope for the future. But in the meantime, may they set their minds on things that are above, putting to death the deeds of the flesh, putting on the deeds of the Spirit. And we pray that your Spirit will help us. And I pray for my friends here who don't know Christ. I pray that even today they might see the the glory of Christ and his cross, that they might see the wonder that, that your son clothed himself in frail humanity, died a death in our place, and lives forevermore to save those who will come to him. God, you can do a work. You can save. We plead with you to do so. We pray that you might accomplish all of your purposes for your people today. Amen.